Hello and welcome to Off Piste, the pod all about skiing and occasionally getting nerdy about music and songs that have inspired our special guests. My name is Amin Momin. I founded Momentum Ski and Momentum Events, a specialist ski company in 1996, with a single vision to enable everyone to enjoy the whole Alpine experience as much as I have, bringing people together with the help of my knowledge and experience, and in doing so, guaranteeing you the trip or event of a lifetime. I'm here with my co-host, Shemi Orcott, Britain's most successful multidiscipline skier, presenter of Ski Sunday, and founder of CDC, who organized some of the most amazing performance ski racing camps around the world. Between us, we have skied extensively around Europe, North and South America, as well as New Zealand, Australia, and even Iran. Don't hold it against us, though, guys. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I can vouch for the fact that some of Ammon's events are the most epic events I've been to. I met Heston at one, and we've had the most incredible ski days and party days together, haven't we? Amazing. Some of the stories we might actually be able to share during this podcast. Some we should, probably, we should keep <laughs> close to our chest. Now. Sorry, sorry. Go on. Sorry, Shemi. No, I'm too eager. <laughs> our very special guest on our first podcast is the one and only Heston Blumenthal, OBE. Now, before I get into all your accolades, Heston, I have heard your surname pronounced a few different ways. You say it and I will correct myself. Uh, Blumenthal, Blumenthal, Blumenthal. I, I don't know. Oh, so it's actually quite... The TH is Thal, Blumenthal. Well, it's Thal or tal. I don't really mind, actually. The reason, I, <clears throat> the reason I'm asking is because um, my surname that everyone says is Alcott is actually, and I just told them in this, my real surname is Alcock Power. And I'm no kidding, that would be my birth certificate surname, Power Alcock. My mum was a feminist and my father is still Alcock and they wanted to hyphenate their names and they decided the evolution of the English language meant that that wasn't going to be uh, love- correct for my brother's. I love the way you've kicked off this podcast with a proper boom. Boom. A proper boom. Low I bow. Did, I did find that one. Well, when I was about 40, early 40s, I did my first uh, Jonathan Ross appearance. And so I'm on, I'm on in a green room and I'm sit, sitting next to uh, Tina Fey. And she's half Greek. And I was about to go on. I could hear Jonathan introducing me. And she said to me, you do know your name. I mean, shit on you in Greek. Hey, Heston Blumenthal! So I get up, I'm completely discombobulated. I think, was she taking the mic? Because obviously she's a, she's a comic, comedian. And she says, she's serious, she's half Greek. And I, my interview, I don't even remember the first question. Puzzled. Anyway, the next day I get to, get to work and my, my, my restaurant manager, the Greek, Dimitri, I said, Dimitri, my, my name's doesn't mean shit on you in Greek, does it? And he looked at me and smiled and just nodded. Yes, um, <laughs> that was the On my 40th birthday, I found out, and my surname translates to Flower of the Valley, so shit on you, Flower of the Valley. Amazing that you're so famous in Greece. I mean, you're such an icon in Greece with an incredible name. <laughs> but before... Before we start this properly, I do want to read your accolades because I know everyone listening to us will know who you are. But these, I mean, you've worked hard for these. So internationally famous for his award winning three Michelin star of the fat duck in Berkshire, England. Heston is considered to be one of the best chefs of our generation. Although self-taught, he has pushed the boundaries of a traditional kitchen and completely changed the way that people approach cooking through his dedication to creativity, science, precision, along with his relentless research into nostalgia and the history of British gastronomy. Heston has pioneered new techniques through multi-sensory cooking, flavour encapsulation and food pairing. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts, and awarded an OBE by Her Majesty the Queen for his services to British gastronomy. Is that it? Is that it? That's <laughs> it. I mean, oh, gosh, I, 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 come talk on. Talk about the difference in my school report, which was basically <laughs> always must try harder. <laughs> must try hard. Was, was, yeah. was chemistry a big kind of force in your life growing up? And it kind of helped oh, you in yeah. this direction? I found my chemistry O level. There you go. Were you were you busy putting Nutella and tuna together in your chemistry O level, going, this will work, this will work? 
Uh, th- th- did you say Nutella and tuna for a reason? I, I, you, I know that you've just... done one of your podcasts on it. Sorry. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's right. I was thinking, oh, I was... <laughs> so um, I never, um, I don't ever remember being that kind of, I'm going to say that creative, but we're all creative. I think Picasso said, everyone is born an artist. The challenge is to remain an artist as we grow older. Uh, but I had an experience. I grew up in Cornwall. I grew up, that's a, what am I talking about? I grew up in Cornwall. I grew up in London. I used to go to holiday in Cornwall. Oh my God! Um, and I remember, I remember um, um, Jack Shearer a few years ago, G7 summit meeting, saying Britain has the worst food in Europe, second only to Finland, which I thought was a great offence. And clearly, he hadn't been to the UK for years. Anyway, um, in fact, two weeks before. Uh, two weeks after that, it was the London Paris shootout for the Olympics, and the two Finnish representatives withdrew their votes from fin- from from, from, get all my words, my life, from Paris and came to London. I, I think it was the last straw that broke the camel's back. But I say that we got the Olympics because of our food. So there. But when I, when 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 um, I was growing up in the seventies, probably Jack Sherrod was probably correct because he there was only one type of pasta spaghetti in a blue packet you could buy in the supermarket and olive oil you bought from the chemist and poured them into your ears from their block so i didn't grow up with michelin star i didn't even know what a michelin star was i didn't i didn't know what an oyster was i had no idea of this sort of world my, and we used to go to cornwall every year one year my dad um decided we went to france and he'd read about a three mission star restaurant. He's, he had a good year in, in the business. My mum and dad had never been to a, a one-star restaurant before, let alone three-star, and they took myself and my sister with them. And we sat at the foot of this bauxite cliff, n- nestled under the shade of these olive trees, this intoxicating smell of lavender, the noise of crickets filled the air. There was the feet of the waiting staff crunching on gravel, pouring sauces into souffles, carving legs of lamb at the table. Was, I'd fallen down some multi-sensory <laughs> uh, rabbit hole into this wonderland. And the contrast of not having experienced anything before, that was it. I was hooked. So food got, and cooking and eating got under my skin and in, in, and in my blood. And funny enough, where I'm sitting now is 20 minutes away from that restaurant. So my, no my lab now here is, 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 is in the same national park. So that, that moment, I then got obsessed with cooking and I taught myself classical, over years, classical foundation of classical French cooking. Then in the mid 80s, I came across a book written by the American guy called Howard McGee on food and cooking, the science and the law of the kitchen. I'll shut, shut up in a second. This is cut, coming back to a question about the tuna and the Nutella. And in the book, he said that browning meat doesn't keep in the juices. Now, that was the possibly the most biblical kitchen law I've ever read, heard a chef say or seen a chef say on TV, you see it in the juices. But when you put a steak in a hot pan of oil, it sizzles. That's water sizzling. When you if you had a if you if browning the meat kept the juices in, it would be impossible to have a well done piece of steak because you brown the meat, so therefore the juices mm-hmm. stay in. But meat is protein. It's, it's like a sponge. It's wet sponge, 70, 70 odd percent water. The more you cook it, the tighter the proteins contract like scrambled eggs and the more they squeeze the water out. So when Harold said this, that was my light bulb moment. I questioned everything. I became like an annoying kid. Why? Why? I just questioned everything. Um, and that's my, I've got a, a lucky enough to have a coat of arms and my motto on the coat of arms is question everything so i just question everything including myself many many times which is quite difficult sometimes but that, that's how you've become so creative we're because eat, you know with the protein the carbs and and, and yeah. the minerals and you're going actually we can fuse this together to create something sensory more exciting um that yes. that will blow our minds and and that was the comment that started for you and it's the same me being a professional skier there's a line that always starts you on the pathway to to dispute stuff to make something better yes do you, do you find you have to i think you have to go through the basics you have to know the rules or the rules that have evolved and been let's say respected you have to know those and understand them before you can question them and what i found in the process is you know many of these kitchen rules or kitchen laws that, that have formed over the years hundreds or thousands of years okay this they 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 make they made sense then but maybe not now they still make sense now but there's lots of them that came about from different reasons so for example uh don't put 
a lid on a pan of green beans when you're cooking them. Well, that's it doesn't the only danger really it doesn't make a, a, a sort of scientific difference. But if you're in the busy kitchen and you put a lid on it, and it's not a glass lid, you might forget they're in there and you forget how long they've been in there for. So that then becomes a, a, a law, you know. Yeah. What law do you dispute the most that we're using still today that's absolutely rubbish? There's many. Um, don't wash mushrooms, but that's not a big law. Uh, probably the biggest. Tomatoes. Well, the, the, tom- well <laughs> the biggest just law tomatoes, is tomatoes. Just tomatoes. Just tomatoes. That's a whole bracket. <laughs> I mean, profound. Um, yeah, they. Um, I'd say MSD is bad for you. That that's a biggie. That's complete nonsense. It does. I'm I'm quite sensitive to hydration. I do find that I have to drink a lot more water when I've had food with MSG. There, is that true? There is there, there is a well. There, there's two things here. There is a. It is possible that can, people can have an allergy to MSG, but there's no evidence to show any MSG itself. Is 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 actually there's a lot more evidence to show salt is more detri- is detrimental. However, in general, you have MSG or, or one eats MSG in Chinese restaurants. So what happens is the MSG goes onto starches that have been fried. So when you eat, it's it's MSG sprinkled like salt, but you've eaten that normally on on the on the fried starch even pieces of meat chicken or beef have had a starch coat well, even when they're not crispy they put um cornstarch on to tenderize the meat so you're consuming fairly decent quantities of all the starch time. so oil and water fat soaked starch which can then absolutely and plus salt can dehydrate you massively mm. OK, I, I quickly need to hold my hands up and apologies to Amon because we were supposed to go on script. This was our first one. We've got a really <laughs> lovely script and I have completely gone off piste. But that is why this podcast is called Off Piste, because um, I'm a big oh, fan. So and I know we've met before, but I was like, oh, gosh, we're just going to we're just going to chat and go on here. But I do want to bring Amon into it in that he's the god of this podcast. Yes, um, so I'd hell. love to know where you guys first met. Because that's why we're here, because you guys have met and bonded. Um, uh, it was a long time ago, a very long time ago. I was going on a press trip uh, to Ishkil. And uh, I was called uh, to say that also um, Heston is on that flight. And could I give him a lift to Ishkil? We were both going on the same press trip. And as you know, Ishkil, um, apart from his current reputation, but you know, they've been pioneers in terms of uh, opening really big with incredible acts and concerts and also end of season as well. So, you know, they've had Elton John, Tina Turner, Muse, Lenny Kravitz, you know, Scissor Sisters. And guess what our luck was that year with Heston? Oh, I can imagine you guys, you guys came together on a really cool rock concert, something super cool. I can imagine like tabletop raving, was it? Uh, no, um, <laughs> I, no. <clears throat> it was uh, Pussycat no, Dolls. We had- <clears throat> well, we- Pussycat Dolls? <laughs> Yeah, and we were actually first. We were actually dumped on Amin um, at the airport. You gave us a remember? Oh yeah. no, that was I oh, know I'm confusing. That was a later one. That was another. No, it was what was that? No, Ishko. It was a pussycat was, doll. So, that, so basically, do, when did we? When did we, you, Gary Hunter, and I share the car together? That's the one to you, Ishko. Okay, so we were told that you you were told you were going to have to to take two people to Ishko. Correct. And the first Lamin's time we met was in the airport and in the car. Yeah. And then we... <clears throat> and I just then, remember um, being oh, in a car and you, you were asleep for most of the journey. And, and uh, I said to Gary, uh, so uh, tell me more about this guy here. You know, because I, as you know, I was hugely into food uh, through a mutual friend, but then I kind of lost interest uh, for a period of time. And they said, he said, oh, this is Heston Blumenthal. You know, he's been voted the best chef in the world, best restaurant in the world. I was going, oh, hmm. Okay, all right. Yeah, you, you guys are bypassing the fact that you you, you went to a Pussycat Dolls concert. I I've just well, okay. you were like on here this pedal stool. I know you're both very cool people, and now I'm just imagining you, you know, dealing at some girl dance moves to Pussycat Dolls. Awful. I think I could empty a stadium if I tried any dancing, to be honest. <laughs> but we we were given. Do you remember? I mean, we were given VIP treatment with in in you know, big quotations. A backstage VIP, and we stood the the VIP area. It was obviously it was cold. It's an ish cold, but it, we were just it was just one aluminium security barrier 
<laughs> with a cold can of beer. And then I remember we the only bit I remember with the concert, there were two bits I remember the concert. Um the the one of the one of the singers showed a photograph of her what she was like then before she had plastic surgery and told all the crowd that you too could be like this if you yeah. if you want it enough. Yeah, and the second the, the best one, you remember this one, I mean she said. Good evening, all you beautiful people of Ishkel, Australia. No, she didn't. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Cringe. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, I, I just I mean, remember yeah. them being very cold. You know, they were just freezing. They weren't wearing much and they were freezing. And it was anyway. But, you know, uh, at least so I met what, Heston. Whilst I met there, Heston, Heston is, that, is that when you got into skiing or had you already been kind of a mountain? No, I went. No, I went once when I was 14 and um, and then I didn't ski again. Before I cooked, I, I kickboxed for years quite uh, seriously. And um, I managed a, kickbox, a combination of kickboxing. I fell off the roof, broke my leg when I was a teenager. I was in traction, then the kickboxing and then all the hours of standing in the kitchen. My leg, my, my right leg was, was knackered. It was basically my back. So after several years of... <clears throat> um, Osteopathic, osteopathic treatment and other other work on my back. I you know, I needed a back operation, and the surgeon said to me, "If it's successful, it was just giving me a sort of an example. You could book your skiing holiday in a year." So I got invited on this trip by um, Gary, who was the guy that was the producer for the In Search of Perfection series I did from the BBC. He invited me, and it was almost a year to the day. So I was like, yes, I'm going to celebrate because my back's repaired, so I'm going to go skiing. And that really was the trip that I fell in love with skiing. Um, um, I also must have fallen in love with falling over because I fell over a lot. And you, <laughs> broke, you, your and you broke your glasses. Well, then one, of my, one of my falls was on my glasses. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. There's not many people in the world who use skiing as a sport to get over another injury. Is there? It's normally always the other way down. Skiing normally ruins everyone, but it actually made you. You found a new passion from having back surgery. Yeah, it was. A, yeah, my back. My back is so good. I can now ski. The rest of me had a more of a difficult time skiing, but my back. My back didn't have a difficult time skiing. <laughs> but, but you've yeah, got that permanent on. excuse. If anyone ever says, "Oh, Heston, you need to bend your legs more, get bigger angles," you're like, "Hey, listen, let me tell you about my back." There you go. Yes. Win-win. <clears throat> yep. Win-win. And, and, and that started the, uh, uh, the beginning of a beautiful relationship with skiing and a beautiful relationship with Amin. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> so um, uh, we have asked Heston to pick five songs that have meant something to him in his, uh, in his life. You know, the way you think about multi-sensory food uh, that triggers memories, you know, it's the same for me, Heston. You know, I, I can hear a song and it just takes me back to an exact point in time in my life. It's time to make a start with your music selection. What's your first song and why have you chosen it? So my, the first song I've chosen is, you might have heard this, I mean. It's called Cashmere. Mm. And it's by a small band <laughs> called Led Zeppelin. Uh, and I chose this because I remember one of our trips. We've been on many ski trips together, but I remember driving there was there was mountain on one side it might have been both side of lake geneva i can't remember but i remember we we're in the car and cranked um cranked um cashmere up uh and it became one of my you know the the, 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 the music you play when you ski when it really kind of the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you think you're you think you're cherry or cock and um uh, yeah, so it's Kashmir. Kashmir by Led Zeppelin. <laughs> 